This was supposed to be edibles, and I think an edible got canceled out, so I'm not edible, but I do trees. So, next best thing. Uh, I guess it'd be better if we could do both. But a um, little bit about myself. I'm uh, surprisingly, I just realized today, in my 49th year of uh, horticulture, arboriculture, and um, wondering what I'm still doing in it, but I still enjoy it and uh, need something to do in my retirement. So I'm at it, uh, started way back in 1974 in Lincoln, Nebraska as a tree climber. If you guys know what tree climbers are, when you're pruning trees in the winter months, you've got guys up there in ropes, hanging from a rope. And that's how I started. Um, 19 years old, not really knowing what I was going to do in life, so that sent me in a direction pretty quickly. But uh, after that, I've been in uh, woody plant uh, research, propagation, nursery management, back to NDSU and the woody plant release program, and uh, still doing that to this day. So I'm going to talk a little bit about just some common, very general trees. Everybody's aware of emerald ash borer now in Moorhead. Um, it's been creeping up I-94 as people move firewood. It will be here at some point. We've got parks around here that people going across country uh, bring firewood from infested areas, and that's how emerald ash borer is moved, and it will be here at some point. So we need to get ash out of our minds and start looking at other trees that, that we can be putting in here. Let's see if I can advance here. There. Um, some of the problems we have, North Dakota is pretty, uh, pretty unique, but not so unique in the plains, but unique to other areas of the country. Um, you know, we've got a lot of, in urban areas, disturbed, compacted soils. We have high pH soils. We have, our state is one of the highest pH soils in the country. Uh, so, I mean, typically running um, high sevens into the eights. That limits a lot of tree species. Moisture availability. North Dakota is the eighth driest state in the country, which is amazing. It's the number one driest state in the winter, which if you'd look outside, that'd be hard to believe. But overall, over the years, we're the number one driest state in the winter. Uh, planting sites surrounded in close proximity to concrete and asphalt. Everywhere, all cities, that's raising the temperature of the planting area. Uh, winter application of salts more and more. Didn't see that a lot when we moved up here 40 years ago, but now now it's, they're used quite a bit. And emerging and present insect and disease issues, emerald ash borer, pine wilt, nematode. There's a lot of things that are gonna be hitting our trees here at, at some point in the future. So, emerald ash borer. I just wanna mention this because um, we've been hearing about it since about 2004 and now it's finally at Moorhead, so it's moving across. This is uh, some pictures my brother sent me from, my, from his neighborhood in Lincoln, Nebraska. Emerald ash borer moved in there several years ago, and, and you can see the progression, you know, the, uh, the trees, the removal, and then you have whole blocks that are, that are totally eliminated of uh, ash trees. Unfortunately, they did not learn from the Dutch elm disease at the time. Um, the, new, the new developments in Lincoln, Nebraska went into hundreds if not thousands of ash, but they were also all one cultivar of ash. So talk about lack of diversity. So they planted thousands of, of one cultivar of ash, and it's ripping through there now. They have contract crews come in, just totally devastating blocks, much like we did with Dutch elm disease was when I was on a crew, where we would do the same thing to neighborhoods, take an oasis and cre create a desert out of it with the removal. Um, the other thing in, in um, plantings, string trimmer and mower damage uh, is probably the number one um, cause of death and, and damage in plantings, and this is all over. I've watched landscape plantings here in Bismarck where landscape maintenance crews have killed the trees that were there. They've been replanted, and then those landscape crews then go back in and kill the, the trees that they've replaced them with just by constantly girdling them. Um, it's one of the worst, worst things you can do. 2,4-D um, drift is uh, bad to worse in many areas. You can totally, totally uh, weaken a tree over a couple of years with 2,4-D. With I know this isn't talking about trees, but I kind of get into what's going on with them too. We get a lot of winter sun scald here, especially on maples, thin bark trees, and chlorosis. Um, I've got a mixture of, of slides here from Fargo when I was at NDSU and back here again, but uh, Fargo's worse in chlorosis than we are here. But still the same thing. Some trees are very intolerant of, of high pH soils. 
So there's a, you know, some of the species we should not be planting, red maple, swamp white oak. But when you look at plantings, and, and uh, you can drive down a street and you can see a tree doing very well, and then several not doing well. And the tree in the foreground is one of the elm cultivars. In the back left is a, uh, uh, a birch cultivar. Further down the streets, a Freeman maple cultivar. So, you know, the right tree, the right place is, is what we need. Here's from the other end of that. The elm is on one end, and this is a, uh, a philodendron um, Ammer cork tree on this end. So they're very tolerant of our soils too. So it's mostly matching some of these trees to the correct site. Um, I won't go over this a lot. A number of different, uh, different genera. I always kind of start out with bur oak. Everybody knows bur oak. It's native essentially in, in a lot of areas across the state. The uh, Red River, Cheyenne River, Missouri, uh, up into the Kildare Mountain areas. It's a native oak. They get very large. It's very tolerant of our conditions. You know, they'll grow to 250 years out on their own in the hills out here. But they create a very massive tree, so you have to keep that in mind when you're planting them. And uh, a little bit in, in what's happening in tree selection and improvement, especially for boulevards, um, selection for more upright forms of, of trees. And this is just a couple of bur oak. Um, top gun on the left is Bylands out of Canada. Uh, Urban Pinnacle is out of J. Frank Schmidt Nursery in Oregon. Urban Pinnacle is actually out of North Dakota seed source, so fully hardy here. But just happened to grow in a more columnar fashion, which better fits into boulevard plantings. There's some other oaks that um, I see popping up more and more around town, uh, narrow, the narrow type oaks. This is called Crimson Spire. It's a very upright hybrid oak. And of all the hybrid oaks, and there's a lot of them, some are total dogs, do not even live here. Some are okay, but Crimson Spire is, is a very, very good tree. So it's one that uh, we can try in our area. I see the city of Bismarck has planted some downtown areas and along some of the main uh, streets, north-south streets also. So it's a neat, neat little tree. For a, a large size tree, this is an NDSU release. It's another hybrid oak but it's called prairie stature oak. It's a large oak. It's a hybrid between English oak and the native white oak. And uh, gets this nice fall color, um, does very well on soils here. So it uh, tolerates our high pH. Um, there's several scattered around. There's some in Sertoma Park that just were a beautiful orange to orange red this last fall. Um, so it's a nice tree to, tree to try here. And the trees that I'm talking about are all available through the nursery industry. So it's not something that's maybe or could be in the future. They are available if the local uh, nurseries and garden centers are utilizing those. A little bit about hackberry. Hackberry now is one of the go-to trees that we've lost since we've lost uh, white ash and green, green ash. So hackberry is being uh, utilized a lot. The problem with hackberry is um, you want to make sure it's a northern seed origin. Uh, one of the big problems in the nursery industry out west, and they realize this, is so hard to get enough hackberry seed, northern hackberry seed. A lot of their seed may come from Oklahoma, southern Kansas, some of those areas where it's hybridized with sugarberry. When sugarberry is a hackberry, but it's not hardy here. And so, um, Bismarck Parks ran into that uh, where a lot of their hackberries died halfway or more down on uh, that spring of 21 when things warmed up early. And in looking at them, the trees I looked at, it looked like they had sugarberry parentage in the, in the background. So we need to make sure we have a uh, known northern seed origin. This is prairie sentinel. There's not many cultivars of hackberry at all. This is prairie sentinel, a very narrowly upright one for boulevard plantings. Um, not one of my favorite trees, but as I see them get bigger, they're not bad. Very narrow crotch angles on it. I think it might be a maintenance problem in the future. But, but you see them around, and they're quite noticeable when you see them planted on a boulevard. Um, northern, uh, hardy northern honey locusts. Not all honey locusts are created equal uh, in their origin and hardiness, but... Um, there's a number of them around town that are doing fairly well. Um, there are several cultivars that have a little bit of problems, but, but uh, honey locust is actually for droughty soils, high pH, a, a good choice. 
when they're young, they need some protection. They're susceptible to winter sun scald on the bark, but once they get going and rock and rolling, they're, they're pretty good. Um, Dr. Herman at NDSU, with his selection of northern acclaim, moved the usable range of honey locusts about 200 miles north. And um, that was a huge thing in the nursery industry and in tree planters in the Dakotas, the Northern Plains, Montana, Wyoming, Minnesota. Um, it's gotten to the point now where it's almost to the point of being overproduced. Um, it's so specked in in plantings because it's the one known hardy cultivar that's out there. But a very nice tree, upward spreading, very, very nice plant. There's a couple others that are hardy. Perfection is a beautiful smaller honey locust, uh, brilliant lemon yellow, fall color on it. And there's one out of Canada called Prairie Silk that's also, also nice. So a lot of honey locusts is just making sure they're hardy. This is northern sentinel honey locust. This is one I selected in central South Dakota. Um, very upright in form. Again. Nurseries are looking for those streets with an with a upward sweep to them so that there's less maintenance on them. Uh, you plant some of these traditional spreading trees on a, a street side boulevard. There's so much work to keep those cut back for the, uh, the, all the trucks, garbage trucks, recycle trucks, uh, moving trucks. So this is more of an upright form and it's now available in the nursery trade. We have a couple little ones on the left in Sertoma Park. I had to get a couple since uh, since it was my tree, but uh, it, it's kind of neat to see it. A lot of these plants, and I should mention it on the oaks too, um, all these trees flower, and most people don't think as trees as pollinators, and this is a project I'm working on now, but their flowers may not be as noticeable. I mean, if you talk about flowering trees, you think of crab apples or magnolias or something, but all these trees flowers and produce pollen and nectar and are heavily, heavily utilized by um, uh, insects. So uh, especially the oaks, honey locusts, maples, Kentucky coffee tree are very, very heavily used by insects if any of you have an interest in that, which is pretty big right now. American linden is another one that's heavily used by bees. Um, American linden is native to North Dakota. The cultivars are selected from out of here, but they do very well here. They're very tolerant of heavy soils, uh, are uh, higher pHs and, and just do extremely well. There's a number of cultivars of American linden. Some of them are very pyramidal. Again, those narrow street side trees where, where traffic can pass and they don't require a lot of pruning every couple of years on them. The other linden you see here is little leaf linden. If you see the very dense, uh, very dense crowns, mostly what's planted here is green spire linden. And it does very, very well here. Very nice tree. So lindens, lindens are a good choice for uh, uh, boulevard and, and lawn plantings. Cast a pretty dense shade if you have, a, have an area where you want a dense shade in there. This is a little leaf linden out of uh, Jeffrey's Nursery in Manitoba. And I found a couple of them scattered around Bismarck. It's called Golden Cascade. It's actually a weeping form, which I kind of find attractive. So extremely hardy, extremely hardy, zone three. And then another one out of Jeffries is Harvest Gold Mongolian Linden. And Mongolian Linden um, probably is being planted more than any of the other Lindens right now in landscapes around town. Um, extremely hardy. It doesn't get as big either. It's a smaller tree, smaller in form. Um, Gets a nice fall color, shuts down early, so it's, it's a very tolerant tree. And most, most nurseries and garden centers would have this available. Uh, Ohio Buckeye, everybody uh, has an interest in Ohio Buckeye. And um, I have a hard time telling people these are not horse chestnuts, they're Ohio Buckeyes. Uh, European horse chestnut is very rare here. And you can tell immediately if it's a European horse chestnut, just by grabbing the terminal buds. If your fingers stick to them, that's a European horse chestnut. The Ohio buckeye don't have that stickiness on it, but buckeyes now are also one of the trees in the nursery industry that is being promoted to take up slack from loss of ash. And there's been work on those also. This is Autumn Splendor out of the University of Minnesota. 
It's actually a hybrid between Ohio Buckeye and Yellow Buckeye. Um, very high quality foliage. Turns maroon in the fall, but for some reason it doesn't always turn maroon in the fall. But uh, very nice tree, widely available. Um, the nuts on it are smaller than some of the regular buckeyes, so not quite as bad. Homestead Buckeye is an SDSU release and uh, very early coloring, nice tree. And that's, that's sometimes available in the nursery industry too. NDSU has a release called Prairie Torch. Unfortunately, it's the most brilliant of any of these in the fall, but the branching is horizontal. So the uh, nursery producers have a hard time Tie, they tie them in bundles, and what they do is get a lot of breakage on those horizontal branches. So they've moved away from Prairie Torch. This is one now that uh, released through NDSU, um, Lava Burst um, Ohio Buckeye. And this is a very upright, compact form. This is a tree I found in about 2005 and watched it for a number of years until I went to NDSU and we put it in the program and released it. Um, so many of these trees, it takes 15, 18 years before they're ever in production. So, and now there's two nurseries producing it, so it should be available pretty, pretty quickly um, from the Western nurseries. I saw Sooner Plant Farm in Oklahoma had it available earlier this year. So it is getting to be a, a, available in some, some nurseries. But for a smaller area where, I, where a compact uh, tree would fit in well, this is kind of a bet for that. Everybody familiar with Kentucky coffee tree? No? It's a uh, legume. If you're familiar with the legume family, you can see it, the females produce those pods, like on the left. They're very nice trees. This tree is kind of uh, really in vogue right now. I have a wholesale seed collection business, and I collect uh, coffee tree in uh, South Dakota and Nebraska. And I can't collect enough uh, to fill the needs anywhere near the needs. So very, very uh, adaptable, tolerant tree. It's uh, one of the biggest things is female trees are objectionable in the landscape. And um, they produce these hard, hard pods that, you know, you can rake them up. Um, I nearly got divorced over this. My, my wife was going to collect some for me down in Lincoln when she was down in Nebraska. So we have a long, pole, we call it a hooker. The big joke is we travel with our hooker. Um, <laughs> sorry if that's offensive. Um, so we pull on those branches and knock them off in the spring. And she was down there and looking up when she did it. And she still claims it broke her nose and hit her right in the nose. And she was mad as a hornet when she got back. <laughs> just, so the, the female trees are not what is desired, but they do get into the landscape. There are some male cultivars, Espresso, Prairie Titan, Stately Manor, a new one that's come out is called True North. Uh, and they do not produce those pods on them. So uh, Espresso, we've had a little bit of trouble with. I'm not sold on that. Uh, it's out of Minnesota. We would think it'd be winter hardy, but it's had some dieback. And again, on the left, um, they're not noticeable. These aren't open yet, but Kentucky coffee tree flowers very heavily also with male or female flowers. That's why we can select for either sex, really. And uh, boy, you can stand there and the wasp and bumblebees hit those things. Really, really like them. This is one of my favorite trees that nobody has heard of. Amermachia um, is the worst common name in the world for a tree. And if you say Amermachia, people are going to correct you and say, you mean Amer maple? And it's, no, I mean Amermachia. And it's a small tree. It's an, it's an Asian tree, northeast China, that's really not used a lot, but extremely hardy, pH tolerant. And uh, the unique thing is it blooms in late July. Nothing else is blooming at that time. And then Amermachia comes into full bloom. And every pollinator that's out visits these trees. I have stood under these trees and the air just hums from so many bumblebees. And then you've got monarchs and admirals and carpenter bees and wasps. Just, it, it's incredible the amount that comes there because nothing else is blooming tree-wise at that time. And they bloom so prolifically. Um, I do a whole talk on nothing but elms, so I won't subject you to that. Uh, elms, of course, are the big 
the big tree that we lost with Dutch elm disease and then the breeding programs and selection programs that have come about since then. So um, I always, and this is a picture in Fargo, I could also insert a picture in Bismarck. Um, we like all of our streets to be exactly the same for as far as we can see. And that's the worst thing we can be doing. You know, we should have five, six different cultivars on each, not cultivar species, on each block, uh, genera on each block. But sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. So elm selection and hybridization. American elm is highly susceptible to Dutch elm disease. It had no defense, just like the American ash have no defense against emerald ash borer. <clears throat> the Asiatic trees co-evolved with Dutch elm disease. The Asiatic ash co-evolved with emerald ash borer. So they have resistance that we can use in breeding. And a lot of this has been going on in the elm world. Um, elms were such a mainstay the world over, not just in the US, but the world over. But in our country, there's, there's a number of programs that have been been doing breeding and selection of elms. Um, you know, National Arboretum, um, there's several out of Jeffrey's Nursery. Um, North Dakota State, we've got two selections of elms. So there's a lot of work that's been going on. These are just some of them that have come out that you may hear of, and I'm not gonna hit on every one of them. Um, Triumph is probably the most uh, commonly planted. There's also Accolade, um, New Horizon. New Horizon is a very nice tree. If you want to plant, a, plant an elm, very nice tree. Japanese elms, highly resistant to Dutch elm disease as the species themselves, and they're also used in breeding. So freedom, not used much. Discovery, Japanese elm. Uh, there's a whole block in Bismarck planted with nothing but discovery. I think it was the developer of the apartments that did it. it looks really neat, I love it, but what have we done? We've planted one cultivar there the whole block again, but uh, very nice elm. Um, North Dakota State has had long-term evaluation programs. If you're familiar or have heard at all of the uh, Absaraca Horticulture Research Farm, and they have an open house every year in late August, early September. But Dr. Herman started that in 1974 with uh, plantings and the continue with Dr. West today. And so there's materials in there that have been under evaluation you know, for 20, 30, 40 years. And this was one of them, um, Northern Empress Japanese elm. And this is a really unique elm. It's not a big tree, 25 to 28 foot. Um, beautiful, beautiful foliage on it, very nice. The biggest thing, it is hardly produces a seed. It produces so few flowers, it was hard for me to even find flowers to do crosses on it. So that's a big selling point immediately with some people. Uh, what's really unique in the fall, it doesn't turn dingy yellow, it turns this kind of apricot burgundy color, the foliage on it. So, and this is available, Bailey's has gotten into it, several of the West Coast nurseries, so the tree is available, it's a small landscape tree, very nice tree. Uh, American elm, there's a few cultivars that have proven resistant uh, through testing programs. Um, you always get somebody saying, well, my elm has lived, you know, forever. Uh, so it's resistant. Well, that's not the case. It just hasn't gotten DED at the right time with the vectors. So uh, unless it's gone some long, undergone some long-term testing, they're really not uh, resistant. So there's a number of them. Uh, New Harmony, Princeton Elm. I'll just do a few of these. Prairie Expedition is out of NDSU. Valley Forge, uh, I would not recommend. The, the crotch angles on there are so narrow, it's just going to break out. Jefferson, and a couple new ones that are still being trialed, St. Croix and Colonial Spirit. So this, this is Prairie Expedition. Uh, Dr. Herman selected this in the uh, Wild Rice River south of Fargo. Um, DED had gone through there and basically killed all the elms in that river valley. He uh, selected this tree, had it tested. There's two strains of Dutch elm disease in our country, and it was uh, highly resistant to both strains. So uh, it's quickly made a cultivar. Um, I like to tell people this tree is now dead though. And it's not from Dutch elm disease, it's because a beaver came up and said, hey, there's one tree left here, and, and girdled the tree and killed it. But fortunately, there's tens of thousands of prairie expedition elms across the country. It's, it's one of the preferred elms in the nursery industry. This is on a street in Fargo. These are hackberry, the smaller ones. See that tree in the middle is, is 
Prairie Expedition American Elm. It doesn't care where it's planted. In fact, you want to plant it in your, shouldn't say crappiest, in your worst spots because you don't want that real rampant growth on, on a lot of these elms. You want to slow them down. Put them on those sites that are tough, that are tough for other things to grow, and elms just love it there. You know, just put them out there and say, you know, good riddance, we'll see you in a few years, and they're happy with that. This is Princeton American Elm. This is an upright type American Elm. Um, and it's extremely winter hardy here. Uh, here's a, on the right the street in Castleton. On the left is my wife with a couple of them with the uh, um, Western Tree Trials that we did with, with Joe Zelesnik. And um, just doing super well. We'll see. There's been reports of a couple of them going down with DED, but we'll see. Any, <clears throat> any elm, even highly resistant elms, if they're damaged, uh, possibly under enough stress, hit at the right time, can get Dutch elm disease. The resistant ones tend to kind of wall that off though, where they can stop it. If you really want a lot of information about elms, Joe, stand up and take a bow. <laughs> Joe was the lead author on this and a few of us helped him. And so Extension has a publication with elms for North Dakota. And it, it is very valuable. I think it's the best one in the country. So, I do. <laughs> uh, and a little native tree that a lot of people aren't aware of. Uh, it's in the Cheyenne River Valley, Red River Valley. I think it occurs up in the Pembina Gorge. Is um, ironwood or hop horn beam tree. Um, amazingly, these are in the birch family, but without all the problems of birches. These are a, a drier planting, drier site planting tolerant of high pH and dry soils. Um, just an interesting small tree. Uh, being used a lot more, again, seed source is critical. A lot of the seed source had been coming out of the southeast and the east and not doing well here. You move it out here with the right seed sources, they do very well. It even occurs in a few spots in the Black Hills and over onto the Wyoming side, which we visited. So it's, it's a nice little tree. Japanese tree lilac, um, I listened to a, uh, at a conference last week and a fellow from Sweden and they had taken, I don't know how many genera and actually subjected them to increasing uh, lack of water, however they do that, uh, in greenhouses and sorted out which trees perform best under increasing um, drought conditions. Uh, Japanese tree lilac, let me see, what was the other one? Um, Gemnocletus, uh, Kentucky coffee tree. And there was one other that they really stood out because they were so much more tolerant of adverse conditions. But you see these blooming in uh, around mid-June here, sometimes a little earlier, sometimes a little later, and uh, very popular. If you go by I.D. Ford, that uh, belt on the south side along Expressway, which has probably had the most abuse of any trees in town with salt, semis, uh, vehicles running into them, everything, uh, asphalt, concrete. They bloom prolifically every year and just do their thing. This is a little one in Fargo. Um, again, too many planted in a row, but it looks neat that way. But um, the, uh, the standard in the nursery trade is ivory silk. Um, and it is a very nice tree. There are other cultivars. There's a number of other cultivars. Uh, I guess I didn't have them on here. I had to delete a bunch of slides. Pekin lilac is another tree lilac. It's now considered a subspecies of Japanese tree lilac. So um, very nice uh, selection on the left from NDSU for the bark is called Copper Curls. Uh, on the right from Chicago Botanic Gardens is called Summer Charm. They've been selected for this real coppery peeling bark on them. So they've got winter interest, like we need some winter interest here of some kind. So the bark is very, very interesting on them. And they're white flowering. There's a gold flowering, Beijing gold. Prairie gem is kind of an old standard of uh, flowering pear. Um, used more in our area, not out of this area, but very dense round type tree. Another NDSU release. And here's a couple, uh, Mountain Frost uh, is out of uh, Bailey's in Minnesota. So another Usurian pear. Usurian pear are cold hardy at about zone 3A. Uh, unfortunately, if you get them pollinating together, you get these golf balls 
Um, so you want to plant far away from other pear trees if you can, but even those, if you have deer in your yard, they won't last long at all. So I don't know if it's a good thing or not. But. Uh, birch, this is another one. I have a whole talk on birches and why not to plant them. But paper birch is native in North Dakota, uh, actually does fairly well. Again, critical, some of these trees that have huge ranges, critical to get uh, sources from our area. There's some cultivars on them that are doing pretty well out at Absaraca, and you can see them all here. Prairie Dream uh, is an NDSU release. And Prairie Dream, um, actually, Dr. Herman collected seed in the Kildare Mountains. If you all know where that is, north of Dickinson. Grew out of population. And uh, this selection, Prairie Dream, has its nice white bark on it. Um, for years and years, uh, this is, we have very bad bronze birch borer pressure at Absaraca. Um, very little, but now, through a couple of these drought years, the last few years, um, it is getting bronze birch borer in it. But we've had 45 years of a good birch tree, which is really good, actually. We do not recommend planting like the uh, European white birch, which is so susceptible to it. This is another one out of NDSU. Um, you know, it was a big tree at one time. Boy, they were cranking these out by the thousands out west where tree, nursery stock comes from and then ships the whole country. And they still are, actually, but very nice. It's a uh, Asian white birch, Betula platyphylla, and uh, doing really well, but now they have seen some bronze birch borer move in on them. Um, in the spring of 21, if we can all remember back that far, it kind of got warm really early, and a lot of these things got active, and then it dropped down again and froze very hard and then, and then started coming back up again. Um, and a lot of these Asian white birches, whether they be Dakota Pinnacle or the uh, Parkland Pillar, um, died halfway down on them. It was really evident. Very few of the native paper birch did, but the, some of these did, and that kind of soured me on them a bit. They, they have grown a lot of them back out of it. Um, not all of them. You can still see tops dead on some, but... Uh, they, they got it. Uh, uh, river birch. River birch is widely used across the country. Again, very critical as the seed source because seeds from, you know, northern Florida and uh, Alabama and those will not perform here. If you can get it from Minnesota, Wisconsin, then they have a chance of doing well here. Their biggest problem is they are high pH intolerant. So you're going to get that yellow foliage like on the lower left. But fortuitously, um, Dr. Herman in his travels uh, saw a really nice um, river birch in Dickinson, uh, of all places to have a river birch growing and doing very well with good foliage quality on it. So he propagated a number of them from seed, and made a selection out of that called Northern Tribute River Birch. And now this is available in our area. Um, the river birches are not susceptible to bronze birch borer. So you can plant a birch that gets no bronze birch borer and that is the, the river birch, and, and northern tribute is the preferred tree for our area based on pH tolerance and temperature tolerance. So very, very nice tree. The exfoliating bark on it just comes kind of off in sheets of white and salmon-colored bark. Really, really beautiful. Uh, another one of Dale's selections, Prairie Horizon Manchurian Alder. This tree was not even used in this country. Again, Dale... Um, Dale was a very forward-thinking guy. He grew out a lot of seedling populations that we still take advantage of at the Hort Farm. But this was his selection of Manchurian alder. Large, kind of bold leaves on it. Very, very nice tree. Um, super tree. Um, I've seen it get some uh, linden scale on it, but they seem to bounce back. But uh, it's being used more and more. The, the large foliage is pretty striking. Um, Bismarck Parks has them planted around. They're growing some as multi-stems, which I think is pretty neat near the, uh, near the uh, interstate bridge there and plantings along the river. You can see on the left, alders have a cone. It looks like a miniature pine cone. That's actually the, the female cone on it. And these catkins are the male catkins that produce the pollen. So this time of the year, those catkins start expanding and it really gives a neat effect to the tree. It's not real messy or anything, but just very interesting in what it does. Catalpa, you see catalpas around. A lot of them don't do well. Um, 
This is Heartland catalpa, a specific cultivar out of uh, J. Frank Schmidt Nursery on the West Coast. Um, it zipped through minus 37, minus 38 at Absaraca with no problems at all. So it might be one if, you're, if your heart is set on a catalpa. I grew up with catalpas in Kansas and, and they were pretty common, but you get up here and they're very uncommon. So the flowers on it, the big flower clusters are very, very striking. So beautiful tree. I mentioned philodendron earlier, um, uh, cork tree, uh, another tree that's got foliage similar to ash, but very tolerant of uh, high pH soils. And you wanna get a cultivar that's male. The females produce little purple fruits, which maybe wouldn't be as bad in our area, but they're considered invasive in the eastern part of the country, so. Um, these I'm gonna go through quick, but every year I get questions about what are those red flowers on these trees? This is an amber maple, and ruby slippers is the cultivar that gets the red seed clusters on them that result from the flowers, but the seed clusters. In the Tatarian maples, um, hot wings is the one that's most commonly planted. Bright red Samaras on the fruit clusters. And every, every year people wondering what, what the red flowers are, but it's the seeds on them. Sugar maple, I'll go through just a few. This is Fall Fiesta from Minnesota, a uh, Bailey's nursery introduction. Does very well here. Nice orange fall color on it. Northern Flare is a sugar maple from um, near Sisseton, South Dakota, actually. Again, uh, Dr. Herman grew out a population from a native stand. It was kind of a glacial remnant in, in the valleys there. And um, he selected one that, which he called Northern Flare. And again, this is available also. Uh, very nice striking fall color on it. So it's a, it's a nice tree. And then out of uh, Jeffrey's Nursery in Portage La Prairie is Unity, which is an extremely hardy uh, sugar maple. Freeman maple cultivars, I kind of dissuade people a little bit. They're so overplanted. Then we get plantings like this that are nothing but autumn blaze. Uh, I didn't put in my slide of a uh, housing development near Fargo where the streets are lined with autumn blaze. Every one of them has a big dead spot on the south southwest side where they winter scald. Um, it's just one of the problems that they're gonna have. You need to plant them where they don't get the winter sun on the trunk. Uh, there are some other nice uh, Freeman maples. If you're gonna plant them in town, you need a, a pH of below probably 7.5 or so. But Sienna Glen is from Minnesota, zone three. Uh, Firefall is another Minnesota selection. Um, very colorful in the fall. But here's the problems with Freeman maples on higher pH. The green trees are hackberries. The yellow trees are Freeman maples. Uh, I'm not sure the cultivar, probably autumn blaze. So you can see green, yellow, green, yellow. And now all these yellow trees are gone. They're dead. Uh, the hackberry are doing fine. They have more room to grow now. So I guess if you want to interplant them as a as a uh, spacer and eventually take them out, it works, but it's kind of an expensive proposition. Colorado spruce, um, next to green ash, Colorado spruce is probably our most widely planted tree in North Dakota. We plant them by the millions. And uh, they're a great tree, they do well here, very winter hardy, um, you know, really suffer our conditions well. There's a lot of cultivars if you want a mid-sized one, a dwarf one, a tall one. You know, you can get any, any Colorado spruce you want. This is before I burst your bubble on this. Um, you know, and you can get ground cover Colorado spruce. There's been so much selections of Colorado spruce. But what's the problem? Um, needle cast, several needle cast diseases are ripping through uh, a number of populations of, of uh, Colorado spruce. And I, I really think it's gonna limit the use at some point, uh, if not already. And uh, you know, if you're gonna plant them, don't plant them tightly in a cluster. Interplant them with something else. Put them out where there's air movement around them, but needle cast is, is devastating on these things. And you'll eventually take them out. Black Hill spruce is used a lot. I'm sure you guys are familiar with that. The spruce that is now becoming more widely used is Meyer spruce. This is actually an Asian species, but shows resistance to those needle cast diseases. So uh, Towner Nursery, of course, produces it. Uh, you can get them in the uh, ornamental nursery industry, uh, becoming more widely available. 
Uh, most of them are seed grown. With, you saw with those Colorado spruce, there's a lot of cultivars. Meyer spruce are all seed grown, so you can have a nice upright one, or you can have one that's wider than it is upright. So it, there's, there's a lot of variability in it, but uh, it does have resistance to those diseases. Um, another one that's, that is, has been totally resistant to needle cast is Royal Splendor Norway spruce. And this is becoming more and more available as uh, some of the growers realize that, that they're gonna have to temper their use of Colorado spruce and, and go to uh, uh, other species. This is a, a cultivar, supposedly Norway spruce, but possibly a hybrid. And another NDSU release, um, very dense, upright, very upright uh, green foliage spruce, but very nice spruce. Douglas fir is another tree. It's not a fir, it's not a spruce, uh, it's its own genera. But um, there's some trees around the state that are doing very well. If you're ever at Wheatland, North Dakota, there's a little cemetery just across the tracks, north side of uh, Wheatland. And they ordered Colorado spruce in 1949. I talked to the groundskeeper there several years ago. And uh, what they got was mostly Douglas fir with some Colorado spruce. Um, back during those days, nurseries, uh, wholesale nurseries, would just go out and dig them up from wild stands. So whoever did the digging didn't know the difference between Doug fir and the Colorado spruce, and they were from Colorado, and they've done very well here. So they've got to be uh, an area probably northern Colorado, maybe higher elevation where they, where they got them. Um, the Towner Nursery has grown a few of these, but um, very nice. Doug fir is a very... Beautiful tree, soft foliage on it. Okay, a tree that's totally resistant to needle cast is larch. It's because they cast their, all their needles every year. So I tell people, if you want one that's not gonna get needle cast, get a larch. But a lot of people don't like that, but you know, you, you don't get the disease problem. So this is, uh, there's two, two larynx or two um, larch we grow here, Siberian and European. Siberian is by far the most common. And they're beautiful trees, very nice, nice trees, upright, somewhat pyramidal, uh, nice uh, lush green foliage on them. Then in the fall, that foliage changes to yellow, to bright yellow, and they lose those needles then over the winter. So um, people always say, well, it looks like dead spruce. Well, what does your ash look like? What does your maple look like? You know, they, I don't think it should be a problem. And again, there's a lot of cultivars of, of larch. Uh, this is one called Varied Directions out at Absaraca. It's kind of a monster looking thing and no two are the same, but there's a lot of different uh, cultivars of them. Uh, I threw in junipers, upright junipers, Medora we're familiar with. Taylor Eastern Red Cedar on the left is, is actually out of a native stand, just seedling stand in a pasture in Nebraska. <coughs> Nebraska. But it's totally hardy here, very narrowly upright. If you're familiar with Italian cypress, if you go to California or Arizona or something, this is a look-alike that's hardy here. You know, it's hardy down to uh, 35, 40 below here. And we have not had any winter burn on them. So kind of a, a neat, uh, neat uh, species. Uh, I always stress, utilize the right tree in the right place. You know, you don't want to put it under power lines. You don't want to have your spruce shaved halfway up. This is a building up north here in Bismarck. They planted aspen under the eaves of this building. Why, I don't know. Um, select an appropriate size cultivar. You know, there's, there's smaller size cultivars of all these trees. So instead of just grabbing something and putting it in, do a little research on it. You can contact me or Dr. West. This is a planting here in Bismarck, use diversity. There must be a half dozen different conifer uh, genera and species in this planting. It's um, just, just by the Burlington Northern tracks uh, near the baseball field. It's grown up quite a bit since this, but you mix these up and sure you may have a disease hit one or possibly two, but you still have the planting. You know, you've got a big diversity in there, so diversity. If you're planting trees down your city block, diversity, diversity, don't run them all the same. Um, biggest thing, mulch lightly. That would eliminate probably 90% of our tree problems if we just mulched. And I don't mean deep, just an inch or two and keep that, keep that down. Um, 
You can see a couple trees here. If you're in Bismarck Parks much, if you're a walker, this is my wife on the left. She takes care of thousands of trees in Bismarck Parks. And what they have to do, I mean, they have deer, vandals, um, everything. So, um, you know, she keeps the ring, mulches. They fence all theirs too. So if you have deer problems, fence them. If you see some lady planting trees or taking care of them, she does annuals, perennials, and thousands of trees. So she's a busy lady and she usually has three or four people with her in the summer. But she loves to talk about plants. So, and I know a lot of people stop and talk to her. So if you see her. So, and that's it. Um, Dr. Wes Simfro is up there. If any of you have any questions, I don't mind emails, gmorganson at gmail. You know, if you've got a tree question, it's better if you send it to Joe Zalesnik, but. <laughs> um, but certainly, and, and in this area, you know, it's, it's uh, widely available. So that's it. Anybody have any questions or anything quickly? Uh, yes? Any fur? fur? Um, he asked if fir, fir trees grow here. Um, balsam fir from Minnesota will grow if it's in a somewhat sheltered location. Concolor fir from Colorado struggles uh, except with the right seed source. There are some nice concolors and there are some real dog concolors. And concolor is the most, one of the most beautiful of the firs. So. I say one to two inches. You get too much and then they tend to want to root up shallowly into it. You want all that to go down. All you want to do is suppress the weeds and maintain some moisture. And then the last one is my observation. Yeah. I've been told Siberians at home don't get dug down the weeds. They don't. But the beetles are more than happy to dig over yes. the weeds. Yeah, yeah. There's always a trade-off. A lot of the elm hybrids, the Asiatic elm hybrids, use Siberian elm and Japanese elm. And so they plant out thousands of progeny and then do selections on those that perform best. Yeah. Greg, do you have any larch, any Siberian larch? What would they prefer uh, as far as the planting site? I, I planted you know, a, lot, a few trees back in the day. I, I just never had much luck with them. And I plant a few at home. I see, uh, his question was on Siberian large planting sites. Uh, and and I'm, sure, I'm sure there's others in NRCS that could answer that better than me. But from what I have seen, they're hard to establish, number one. Um, they need to be out of containers. They need to have moisture that first couple years. Um, but then after that, they, they seem to tolerate dry soils. They do better on, I think, on sands, personally. And Joe, maybe you would be able to say, but. Um, once they're going, I've, I've seen them in some very harsh sites, very harsh sites, but uh, they do not like wet feet. The Siberian does not. Other larch do. But uh, if that helps at all, Daryl. Yeah. Yeah. What's an ideal pH for bur oak? Bur oak will tolerate 5.5 five to <clears throat> eight, 8, 2 or 3. It depends on the source. Northern Plains bur oak which is one of the preferred sources, tolerates pH is well up into the low eights. And uh, you know, those are the ones out of the river valleys here. You know, they're very tolerant of higher soil pHs. Northern red oak have a lower pH though, right? Right, yeah, northern, northern red oak struggles here. They would prefer a pH of about six, five, six, eight, down to about five, five. Yeah, they just do not do well here. Plus our moisture regime you know, it, they're used to uh, 30 to 80 inches of precip a year, and we just don't get that here. <laughs> yes. Have these tree live on that, that uh, you mentioned? They are beautiful down by any source, but do you recommend any internal pruning to keep their the tendons from slamming past? Yeah, they get stemmy on the insides and shade themselves out. Yeah, um, her question was on Japanese tree lilac, you know, pruning on them. And um, definitely, uh, they need to be somewhat cleaned out in the center because they get very stemmy, very dense, and uh, it's just not a good look on them. 
Okay. Oh, one more here. Well, I mentioned um, pine wilt nematode, and that's marching towards us. That, that's going to be devastating if it gets into our state. Um, you know, there's other diseases out there, but there's also cultivars that have been selected um, to kind of tolerate those. Uh, it's interesting. A lot of times you don't know what the next big, big thing is going to be. You know, we almost need to all go over to China and see what's eating their trees right now. Uh, and then what are we going to anticipate? Asian longhorn beetle was expected to be horrible from, uh, it was brought in on pallets. And um, they pretty much had to do eradication zones of everything where they found it, all trees, uh, back in probably from Chicago East. So that would be a bad one, very bad one, if we would get that in here. When we bring these insects and diseases in, especially from Asia, which has the kind of counterpart to our species and genera here, um, but they evolved uh, separated under different conditions. So our plants here have no resistance and their plants there have no resistance to some of our diseases. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. Pine wilt nematode is actually native to the US, so our hard pines don't get it. Scotch and Austrian pine will get it. It is now established in Asia where they grow Scotch pine and a number of other uh, Japanese red pine, Japanese black pine. Their timber, timber industry is really concerned about that because it's killing thousands of trees over there, but yet here we're, we're fine with it except on the introduced pine. So it's a back and forth. It's very interesting, extremely interesting. So, okay, if you have any questions, this was kind of abbreviated version. I have I have talked to a lot of industry and nursery groups and, and what I tend to do is they'll want to talk and I'll say, well, what do you want? And they say, I don't know. So I've either done NDSU materials, but specifically a lot of them are interested in the elm cultivars, maple cultivars, um, you know, birches, all sorts of things, small trees, conifers. So if you have any questions on those, feel free to give me an email. So thank you.